How much can we trust the information given by tools like ChatGPT? The question is less about trust. I think it's more about oversight, right? So uh, Hendrix, uh, not the gin, but okay. the security researcher and professor in, in AI, gives us a really good understanding of what trust misalignment looks like in society today. And he goes through these three notions, which I'll take you through. But first, I think we must understand that AI is getting exponentially better, much faster than we can actually recognize. And this, I think, is one of the difficulties we have in living in changing times. It feels to me a little bit like just before COVID, when we saw China down, but we were living a normal life in Malta, very unable to understand the exponential growth that we had to do as a country, right, to bring up the speeding up of policy, of social change, to match the reality of a fast-spreading viral replication. This moment feels like that, right? We're at the beginning of that curve. It's about to take off. We're kind of feeling the sense of normalcy, but it's not normal, right? The second thing Hendrix argues around this concept of misalignment is that we have this constant capitulation of the thinking process moving towards AI. So this is how it works. For now, and maybe this touches what Ramona said earlier, we're copywriters and we ask ChatGPT to write this little piece of text to us. Next, the business needs to pass on more and more decision-making to AI because AI is simply faster, more accurate, and essentially at the marginal cost of zero. And then suddenly, countries are giving bigger spates of decision-making and modeling to AI. So what's happening over here is that as the AI model gets better at what it does and becomes more complex in doing so, we lose oversight of that particular process. So this is not an issue of whether we trust the technology or not. This is an issue of how do we align ourselves to this type of technology or vice versa, how do we align this technology to the specific values and human flourishing objectives that we have as a society? So I think perhaps I'd put it this way, right? We need to understand the alignment between humans, governments, NGOs, corporations, and once we've understood that, we need to make sure that we're aligning our technology objectives to those particular societal models. So, you know, we're at a turning point. I think the turning point is, you know, how do we regulate this phenomenon? Um, how do we distribute the wealth that AI creates in a way that is more equitable? I think we're at this turning point of asking ourselves, how do we redefine what work really means intrinsically? What is work? Mm. Right? I think we're at this turning point of asking ourselves, do we understand the formulation of public policy in health, in education, in economy, in a world which is driven by um, AI? So I think we build trust through alignment. I think that alignment happens through open dialogue, through public engagement, just like this, right? where we can have these open discussions about what society do we want, what value system should we utilize to create guardrails for AI's development? And I think our objective needs to be to ensure that whatever system we choose, it does guarantee the positive well-being and flourishing of humanity. That has to be the only job of any technological innovation. Mm. If it's not that, it's not worth pursuing. I mean, in terms of answers it's giving us, do you, do you think, therefore, maybe this is partly because it's a new stage, this technology in some ways, but is it, is it right to say, listen, we should be greeting the information we receive from chat models like GPT, uh, chat GPT with a lot of, or rather a healthy degree of skepticism? Is this something that you would advocate, do you think? Um, no, I, I don't think that skepticism is useful. I think skepticism leaves, leads to anxiety. Mm -hmm. I think anxiety leads to mistrust. I think mistrust leads to societal breakdown. No, I think, quite frankly, the opposite is required. And for me, the two words which are the opposite to skepticism is education and interpretability. So by education, I mean, 
you know, it's crazy to me that we've got literacy classes in schools where we teach kids how to understand what food to eat, you know, what's carbs, what are proteins, what do you avoid, but we don't teach digital literacy skills to four-year-olds. I mean, my child is four years old, and he's got a digital life ahead of him. How are we not helping young people now to start understanding, you know, what is misinformation, and how do you determine that, right? Mm. So I think the first answer is education. I think the second one is interpretability. We touched on it a little bit in the first panel, where Alexei was speaking about explainability, slightly separate concept. But I think the answer to skepticism is ensuring that the systems we develop provide enough information to the users to make sure that the cause and effect of that technology is understood by its users. With those two elements, we can build trust, we could avoid unnecessary skepticism, and we could embrace the change that's ahead of us. If I put here, if AI is written by humans, then it might start to display obviously the same biases and preconceptions. This is something we've already discussed a little bit about this. But I mean, how can we really stop this in the sense of, you know, should we censor, you know, these kind of technologies, do you think? It you know what worries me more than the bias in data sets? It's human bias that worries me. And there's no more profound human bias than the expectation that tomorrow is going to be like yesterday and next year is going to be like the last year, right? Recency bias. And this is a problem. So Sundar Pichai, who is Google's CEO, in 2018, when AI systems were much weaker than they are now, said that AI is probably the most important thing that humanity has ever worked on, right? Now, as we're seeing the technology take off, the problem with the recency bias is that we become complacent. It's easier to be skeptical. It's easier to poke holes at why today's technology is weak and inappropriate and will never reach sort of the levels we expect it to. But that's not a plan. What if it does? What if technology does take up the speed that we expect it to? What if AI doesn't simply autocomplete a sentence for you? What if AI autocompletes the code to improve itself? AI writing AI, not humanity writing AI. It can go through multiple generations in a very short period of time. So what concerns me more than bias in data is the human cognitive bias of being skeptical and comfortable and assuming that the reality which we've known for the last years is the reality which will occur going forward. It will not. And that's terrible politics. It's terrible strategy, right? I prefer to live in a world which aligns the tools that we have and that we will have to the demands that society has. That's better politics. Okay, thank you. And actually, JJ, I'm going to kind of uh, put you on the spot slightly here. Um, so in an article that we published in The Times yesterday, uh, you'd said that the Maltese public sector can transform itself uh, by shedding vast amounts of the present mundane chores. Okay. What's quite interesting is that earlier this month, um, in term, when speaking about job creation, Robert Abella talked about the fact that uh, the wages, the amount spent on government employees, and the number had gone up, and I believe the most recent figure was 1.2 billion being spent on this. I guess the question then is, I mean, do you foresee any resistance? It's true, we will be able to make certain things more efficient, and, and what have you, but by doing that, are we going to see resistance maybe even from the state saying, listen, this is going to lead to a, maybe unemployment, and how do we deal with that? I think we need to really focus on the critical aspect here, which is the principle of work, right? So work is a very fundamental concept in society. I mean, if you had to think of it from the Marxist lens, right, the struggle between labor and capital has influenced most policy decisions in the last 60, 70 years. I mean, it's so critical in Malta, even our national anthem talks about protecting workers as, as the most of our religious principles, right? But in a world where AI is the automated labor component, in a world whereby AI is essentially available at a marginal cost of zero, is not unionized, will not take any vacation leave, how do you reimagine the concept of work, right? McKinsey, an important research organization, state that at least 45% of all tasks in the public sector could be automated today. 
So I'd like to get us to jump from this notion of work to the principle of rehumanizing work. Let's unpack that for a minute. So when we tell people, candidates, this job is meaningful, this job is creative, what we're really telling them is, look, we need to pay you to do this job. This job needs to get done, find meaning in it, but in fact, often there isn't, right? Most work is rule-based. Most work is process-oriented. I qualified as a lawyer 20 years ago, and most of the work young lawyers did then and still do today is entirely repetitive, rule-based contract drafting. So let's think of this notion, perhaps not in a year or two, but let's think towards the end of this decade. I think in 2030, there is the re possibility of re humanizing the concept of work, whereby those processes and tasks in our jobs which are repetitive, which are dehumanizing, are actually removed from our portfolio of tasks and given to AI or other robotic tools, allowing us to really find meaning in the work that we do. And this is the massive opportunity for the public sector in Malta and elsewhere, can we reimagine a public sector which cuts away from the repetitive, from the mundane, from the work which is essentially almost irrelevant, right? And instead focus on what the real essence of public service is, which in my view is about treating citizens in a fair, intelligent, fast and dignified way, right? So this is a significant opportunity which Malta is leveraged to exploit, because we're a small nation. It's easier to change a public sector of 55,000 employees than it is to do so in larger states with a much larger cohort of individuals. But let's even dig a little bit deeper. Allow me to be pragmatic with just two ideas I'd like to throw out there. So by default, the public sector is designed to be reactive. Right? So the citizen applies for a benefit, I don't know, social housing or whatever, and the particular process then triggers in reaction to that citizen request. The opportunity here is obvious. It's, we need to invert that model. It needs to move from a public sector, which is reactive, to one which is purely proactive. So let's think of two examples, right? So predictive analytics, you know, one of the cornerstones in our AI toolkit. AI can help look at large, vast amount of unstructured data within our citizen community. And in real time, provide from correlations, ideas. So here's an example. Let's assume that you applied for a social housing application and a single parent benefit. Simply by correlating those two points of data, there is so much that AI can do to help you live in a better society. It might recommend particular jobs plus training programs, which we know have a positive impact on your quality of life, simply by looking at data of other citizens. You know, this is huge. The moment the public sector becomes proactive in providing insight into bettering your quality of life, it changes our perspective of society. The second idea would be around integration, and this is a topic which I feel very strongly about, because political solidarity is about inclusivity. It means leaving no one behind. But in a society like Malta, where you've got you know, 400,000 people with diverse opinions, etc., how do you bring them all into the fold to feel empowered, to feel participative in politics? It's very hard to do using traditional tools, but now for a minute, think about AI and the conversation that Claudia just had about understanding language. What if we could allow AI to understand any unstructured language from any citizen who could now give any input on any element of policy? It's like having political survey running in real time with unstructured input from citizens. I mean, that's lovely because you've created an inclusive environment where you feel close and not disempowered from the political process. And that's a step change for how we build societies. And this is when technology becomes empowering, right? It allows us to capture the sea of opportunities of input out there, capture them in an organized fashion and inform politics. This is the future I want to be part of. 
a future in which human flourishing remains paramount. Hmm. Do you think we need to then maybe consider certain things that maybe we wouldn't have considered 10 years ago to help this? So, for example, things like universal basic income. You know, if we suddenly do something which means a lot of people might lose their jobs, do we need to provide, therefore, for these people? Absolutely. You're, you're spot on there. I mean, these are the new models which we had the luxury of ignoring for the last two decades, but we can no longer do so. I think apart from uh, universal basic income, the other concept is distribution of wealth. You know, the wealth which AI creates is massive, but at the minute, if you think about it, the economic concentration is California. You've got three entities in Silicon Valley which are determining both the future of the technology and reaping most of its benefits. I think that's wrong. I, need, I think we need to start thinking of an economic model which distributes that wealth so as to avoid the issues that we had in, in previous revolutions. I mean, if you want to understand the politics of the 20th century, you need to understand the oil economy, which showed us how the concentration of the benefits created huge income inequality problems. To understand the politics of the 21st, century, you need to understand semiconductors, you need to understand silicon and the chips which are used for AI training. And once you understand that, you realize that the potential there is for us to create a new economic model. And I think that one of the things that governments are not doing sufficiently in Europe is actually taking on large private corporations in doing their own AI experiments. I mean, why should GPT be created by OpenAI? What if two governments in Europe came together and said, we're going to put our next two billion into this, or 10 billion into this? I mean, why does technology have to only be driven the private sector? Yes, these are the new paradigms we need to think about. Universal basic income, distribution of wealth, and public sector reimagination. Okay, thank you.